honor, church. Do you love the presence of the Holy Spirit? I do too. Now love your neighbor and hug them. Squeeze them tight. doesn't bring the presence of God. What brings the presence of God is the heart of people. Somebody say heart. When you come to the house of God with a heart that is ready to love God, His presence comes. It's just who He is. God cannot resist love because He is love. So when you come and you say, I don't care what's going on. I don't care how tired I am. You could have chosen to stay in the bed this morning, but you didn't. You said, I want to be in the house of God. I want to be with my brothers and sisters. So you got up, you put your clothes on. You said, something happens when I come into the house of God. God meets me there. And I want to hear what he has to say to me. Not just that, I want to be able to come into his presence and, and lift my hands. And even though it's like my life may be falling apart in this area, but I'm going to put that to the side to say, God, I love you. God, I worship you. You make all things new. God, you're worthy to be praised. My soul blesses your name. My soul magnifies your name, O oh Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will. I choose. I make a choice. I will. You could will to complain. You could will to be upset. You could will to be frustrated. But I will bless the Lord. I will praise the Lord. I will magnify. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name. What? Together. So you come with a heart ready. And God says, I was already ready. Your ready and my ready works together. And he pours out his spirit. So Rain Fire Church, let's always be very careful not to rush him. If that means on a certain Sunday I don't get to preach, guess what? That's great. Because on every day, he is more important than me. He's more important than the worship team. He's more important than anybody else in this room. Why? Because he is our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is the one that deserves all the glory and all the praise. The, the word is for us, but the worship is for him. Does that make sense to anybody? Rain Fire Church is a place where we're preparing a generation. For the coming of the king through discipleship. What is discipleship? Teaching. When you leave here and your spirit goes to be with God, there there will be no preaching. There will be no prophecy. There will probably not be any speaking in tongues. But there will always be worship. So let's train our spirit now, amen, to learn how to worship God. And forget about who's next to you. Amen. Forget about who's behind you. Forget about, am I crying the ugly cry? Am I messing up my makeup? Yeah. Guess what? None of that matters. Because my soul needs him. My soul. My soul. Most of the time my spirit is alright. But the place of the battle is in my soul. My emotions. My feelings. My mind. I feel a certain kind of way about what's going on in my life. So my soul has to magnify the Lord. My soul has to connect with the promise of God. My soul, my feelings, the way I feel has to connect with God. Because if not, your soul can tell, take you down the wrong road. When your soul and your flesh get together, that's trouble. But when your soul, your emotions, and your spirit are declaring praise and worship to God, are declaring we will press forward, 
no devil in hell can bring you down. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's prepare our tithe and our offering this morning before we go into the word of God. Giving is also a part of our worship. And this church is doing great things. Amen? Amen. And as you get ready to prepare your tithe and prepare your offering, understanding that one, God loves a cheerful giver. That's what the word of God says. When we give with joy because we love God, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. He promises to take care of us and take care of our needs. Amen? And so that is covenant. One day I'm going to have to do a teaching on covenant so that we understand it's not just dropping money in the plate. It's a physical act that engages spiritual principles to move on your behalf. For God to do what he needs to do for you. Amen? And so, let's also keep in mind that we're moving forward with every vision that God has given Pastor Corey. Amen? And so, even across the street, we have taken possession across the street. Let's thank God for that. As the people of God, understanding that God goes before us and God has a purpose and a plan. And so, one giant down, but sometimes there are more giants to overcome, but we cannot become weary in well-doing. And so the latest news that we were given was that because it is a commercial property, it's going to take $5,000 to turn on the electricity. Somebody say the devil is alive. <laughs> so the team, how many of you have been uh, volunteering and helping? Come on, stand to your feet. Those that have helped at any point, if you brought food, if you've been cleaning, come on, stand up to your feet. Those of you that brought food, those of you that have been cleaning, those of you, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So all of these amazing people, come on, y'all better give it up for them. They've been working. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Miss Helen. Thank you, Jacinta. They have been working in the cold because there's no heat. We got a generator so that we could have some lights. But this is what it's about. You have to fight. You're not going to get anything if you're not willing to fight. Amen? So let's continue to believe God together. As you prepare to give, keep that in mind. And go above and beyond today in your giving to say, okay, God, I am a kingdom person and I'm going to do everything that I can to push this vision forward. As well as people that are on Periscope, I welcome you. Welcome you, welcome you, welcome you. Sunday morning. Amen? And so as we get ready to give, let's do that. Do you have an envelope already? Do you already have your envelope? I guess that's a yes. yes. We have a text to give system here, Rainfire. Text Rainfire to 77977. Amen? And so if our ushers will take their places, we are going to ask everyone to stand to their feet as we get ready to bring our tithe and our offering. We're going to do things a little bit different this morning because sometimes people that are coming to sow, they have to climb over other people to get to uh, the offering. So let's just all walk. Come on, we're going to go a little old school. Okay? We all going to walk. Y'all remember? Yeah. We're going to walk. Everybody going to walk. And you know what? Even if you don't have anything to give today, you can always just touch the basket and say, God, give me seed to sow. Amen. Because the word of God says that he will give seed to the sower. If you have a desire to sow, he will put in your hands what you need to sow. I am a witness. Amen. Amen. So if you would put your phone up in the air, your envelope in the air, I, would, I want to bless your giving this morning. Okay? Father, I thank you. I thank you for those that are watching online right now. I thank you for every person that is in this room. I thank you for those that, God, faithfully give their time and their offering, Father God. And even those that bring a special offering today for the different projects that we have going on across the street and also in the new sanctuary. God, bless your people. Bless your people as they give. Bless them, Father God, as they sow into your kingdom. Bless them as they stand in alignment with your vision. Release the wisdom of God. And the blessing of God upon them now, in Jesus' name. Amen. If we can start from the back rows, and then you come around, follow the direction of our wonderful ushers. This old school church right about now. There you go. There we go. Yes. He's intentional. Oh, oh, oh. Little fairy. All things are working for my good. He's intentional.
word, we thank you for your spirit. And I ask right now that you would speak for me. I humble myself before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Would you take your seats this morning in the presence of the Lord and open your Bible to Mark chapter 6. Open your Bible to Mark. Mark chapter 6. Somebody say same old tricks. The devil ain't got nothing new. It's the same old tricks. And the Holy Spirit was really ministering to me this week as I was talking to different people that are a part of the congregation, different people that are part of the family here at Rain Fire Church. And, you know, this person had an accident. And this person, this situation is going on. And that person, you know, and sometimes you look around in church and, and you see the attendance goes up and the attendance uh, goes down. And some Sundays, you know, every seat is full. And then other, other, other days, you know, it's, the attendance is not all that strong. And God started really dealing with me because you have to realize that as the church in America, in the United States of America, there are principalities and spirits and powers that are assigned to every nation. Okay? There are demonic forces, principalities, and powers that are assigned to every nation. And what I've been starting to see is a pattern. Somebody say a pattern. A pattern. A pattern. So as your pastor, it is important for my spirit to be aware and for me to be in communication with the Holy Spirit to be able to see the things that's happening and to be able to point it out so I can then bring it to you and present it to you so that you can say, oh, so that's what's been going on. See, because it is not the heart of God for you to live in depression. Right. It's not the heart of God for you to live in depression. It's not the heart of God for you to live constantly overwhelmed. It's not the heart of God for you to feel like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? The word of God says that you are the head and you are not the tail. The word of God says you are above and you are not beneath. The word of God says that Jesus was placed on the cross and every curse, every curse was placed on him. Every sickness, every battle, everything was placed on him and it was crucified to that cross. And so there are rights, there is identity, there is power, there is anointing, there is wisdom. Everything that Christ is, everything that God is, because Christ and God are one, is available to us. Why? Because we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. What is it to be a co-heir? That means everything that belongs to him belongs to me. So if peace belongs to him, it belongs to me. If joy belongs to him, it belongs to me. If prosperity belongs to him, then it belongs to me. If holiness, come on, without holiness, no man. See, in some things, I'm going to be old school forever. Okay? If he's holy, then I can be holy. Because of the what? The righteousness of God in Christ. Whatever he is, if he's patient, come on. If he's long-suffering. If he's forgiven, if he's married to the backslide, everything that he is, I'm able to be. Because that's why when you look at the passion of Christ or you see a, a picture of Jesus on the cross, and when you see that blood dripping down, you have to in that blood see that every sickness, every pain, every migraine, heartache, depression, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, uh, fibroids, whatever it is that you're dealing with, you have to see those nails and know that, that that situation and that sickness and that depression and that confusion, it was nailed to the cross with Jesus. And when that blood came streaming down, it had the power to break every curse. There was power in the name of Jesus. So there's power in the name, there's power in the blood. Right? We remember those songs. Yeah, yeah. But the enemy comes and he doesn't come with anything new. It's the same old tricks. And so you find yourself, my sons and my daughters, those that call me mom, you find yourself like a yo-yo. Some days you're up. Some days you're down. Some days, oh, I feel like I'm just in victory. And other days I just feel like I'm in the basement. And why is it that that basement feeling always comes on Saturday night? Oh, I got some witnesses in here. You know what I'm talking about? The argument always starts Sunday morning. The depression always starts Saturday night. Somewhere along those lines for you to wake up the next morning and be like, man, I ain't going nowhere. I need some me time. No, you don't. All your me time is going to do is fill you with more demons. you got to get out of the me time and come into the into the we time and say, Okay, God, deliver me because something ain't right. 
I got a spirit on me that ain't right. I got this depression got to go. This sadness. Sometimes you just sit there and you start feeling sad. Nothing has happened. And all of a sudden you just feel, why? I'm just sad. What? The devil is a lie. You got to know how to recognize him and recognize his tactics. And enough is enough. And, and get up off your backside and say, uh-uh. No, I'm pressing my way. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a choice. And nobody can make that choice for you. And so, this is, look at this. So the enemy uses pressure, somebody say pressure, to disconnect you from God. I know you get good meat here. Because the devil's trying to kill me every day because of the way I feed you. You didn't hear me. I said the devil tries to kill me every day because of the way I feed you. Because I'm teaching you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And you are, you are wrecking his plans. So because you're wrecking his plans and you're walking away from sin and he's seeing that he's losing a grip on you. He's nervous. Yeah, yes he is. So he tries to take me out. He tries to take Corey out. He tries to, because if we, if he takes us out, then that affects you because you're connected to us. But he doesn't try anything new. And so number one, he tries to deal with you and he attacks your finances. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. Financial problems. Man, everything was going good. I, how, why, am I, why are my accounts negative? What's going on? Some kind of accident, withdrawal, some, 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 somebody stole your identity, something, I mean, to, to the left and to the right. And it's like, wait a minute. I don't even have enough gas to get to church. What is going on? And all of a sudden, you feel sad. Man, I don't want to go to church. I don't even have an offering. You better get your hips up here. Well, I don't have any gas. You better find somebody that's coming your way. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? You got to fight. Because if he sees that you react negatively to something, he's always going to bring back the same thing. Same thing. Oh, man. The last time I gave her a migraine headache, she stayed home. And she didn't get that breakthrough word that she needed. Let me try it again. Wow. Until you decide to get up and go ahead and come to church anyway, even though you have the migraine, you got to show him that you're not going to be bullied by him. You got to show him that you're not going to bend down to his tactics. You got to show him that he's not going to have authority and power over you. You got to show him that he doesn't have the right to dictate your life. So if I'm in pain, I'm still going to pray. If I got a headache, I'm still going to worship. And even if I ain't got no gas, girl, you going to church, can you pick me up? I, I, I'll give you some gas money next week when I have it. You got to learn how to press. See, living in this microwave generation, we ain't learned how to press. So there's more divorce in the church than there is in the world. Why? Because we haven't learned how to press. We give up on God because we haven't learned how to press. We walk away right before the breakthrough happens because it's hard. Let me tell you, it's hard for everybody. It ain't just you. It's hard. But guess what? The race is not given to the swift. Or to the strong. It's not about how fast you get there. It's not about how big you do it. It's about being consistent. And understanding that it's not by might. And it's not by power. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Sometimes you got to know how to just stand still long enough to see the salvation of the Lord. you got to know how to just lift your hands. Even if all you can do is get them to right here. Even if you can't get them all the way up, God, I'm going to trust you. God, God, I'm just going to trust you. God, I have faith, but help my unbelief. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And learn how to press through. So he attacks your finances. He attacks your relationships. And he attacks your mind. Mm -hmm. The frustration and depression. That's it. What else is there? Think about those three categories. And think about every situation that you face. And it falls into one of those three categories. Financial problems. Relationship problems. Health problems. And then frustration, depression. Things in your mind. Okay, four categories. Well, I'm not feeling good. Health. Well, I'm depressed. Your mind. Man, I ain't got no money. Financial. Man, me and my husband, we just falling out. Relationships. <laughs> That's it. And he just keeps over and over. And over. And he will play you from one category to the next. From one category to the next. So first he hits you with a relationship. Then a bill. Then this. 
Then you feel sad because you can't pay the bill. Then you find yourself in depression. And all the while, you keep distancing your, yourself from God. You keep distancing yourself from the house of God. You keep distancing yourself in prayer. And the next thing you know, you feel so far from God that you feel like you don't even know how to recover. Wow. It's the plan of the enemy. Because he understands that there's a power on the inside of you. That when you are aligned with God, when you're aligned with the Holy Spirit, when you are in your, in your purpose and in your will, when you are walking in that boldness that God has for you, you are going to destroy his kingdom. You are going to reach people that need to be reached. You're going to speak the word of God that to those. But what happens when you're so depressed? You see somebody else depressed and you just want to go and cry with them. No, no, no. It's not time to go cry with nobody. It's time to just get yourself up and say, well, maybe I'll feel better if I encourage somebody else, even though I'm depressed. Begin to pour out your gift. Begin to pour out encouragement. Begin to pour out and say, I can't allow myself to sit in this state. You can't. If you sit there long enough, some people have taken their own lives because they've sat there too long. Thinking about it. And getting deeper and deeper in the hole. Mark 6. And it all comes down to this. Look at this. Mark 6, verse 1. Then he went out from there and came to his own country. This is Jesus. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Come on. Come on. He marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. And they got angry. That's going into my next point. Hold on. Do me a favor. Where's Latez? Do me a favor and, and find me the scripture where it says that Jesus was in the temple. And he, he started reading that scripture. And it says, when he starts reading the Isaiah scripture. You know what I'm talking about, right? So why am I bringing this up? Because Jesus was stepping into his purpose. Jesus had gone to the next level of what God had for him. Okay? And what is one of the first experiences that he had? After he is baptized, after the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Have you ever noticed that in your own life, when you decide to take your prayer life to another level, more attacks come? When you decide, I'm going to be faithful in a ministry, your transportation gets attacked. When you decide, I'm going to serve in the house of God, you start dealing with more uh, financial issues or relationship issues or health issues as ever. Why? Because you decided, I'm going to the next level in my relationship with God. And so the enemy, like a bully in the playground, is sitting and waiting and saying, what can I do to knock him off his square? What can I do to get him to lose focus? What can I do to convince him or her that he or she is not really who God said they are? Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus went and he started walking out the purpose of God for his life and in his own city. So you have to realize that even when you walk into what God has for you, it's not just the enemy that's coming after you, but he will activate people to come against you. He will activate people that will question, well, who do you think you are? Well, I know that God has a calling on my life. Who said? I know your mom. I know your dad. I know you used to do this. I know you used to do that. And you have to be able to be strong enough to be. That's great that you know everything. But hey, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm moving forward. I've made a decision that I'm not going to be stuck in the past. But I'm moving forward. I don't know what you're going to do. But as far as me, I'm going to move forward. Jesus could not even do miracles in his own city. 
And he marveled at their unbelief. Why? Because they were so familiar with him. Because they saw him grow up. Because they knew his mother and his father. Because they knew his brothers. Because they knew his sisters. They were familiar with him. So they could not, uh, they could not respect the call of God on his life. They could not uh, respect his purpose. They could not respect what he was called to do. And that's how you feel right now with a lot of people. They can't see you for who you are in God. But you have to be able to see you for who you are in God. You have to be able to see you. Okay? Somebody can come up to me and say, well, I don't think you should be a pastor. I don't think you should be preaching the gospel. And I don't think I, you're disqualified because you're too light-skinned. Or you're disqualified because of this. Or you're disqualified because you're too short. And who do you think you are? And I have to be able to say, amen, I love you, God bless you. And in my heart, remain unmoved because I know who God says that I am. But what happens is if you're not sure who you are in God, then somebody else comes against you. And the next thing you know, you sit in a corner somewhere and say, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not called to start this business. Maybe I'm not going to graduate. Maybe I'm not going to make it. And you start questioning everything that God has said about you. And the next thing you know, you find yourself in sadness. You find yourself in depression. You find yourself disconnecting from God. He has no new tricks. Right. He doesn't have anything new. Think about every time in your life that you were trying to go to the next level. Think about every time in your life that you decided you were going to get serious about your relationship with God. Think about every time in your life that you said, I'm going to do something new that I've never done before. And answer this question for me. Has there been a setback? Has there been something that came to push you and to say, you're not coming through here. It's like a little troll by the bridge. Say, if you can't answer my riddle, you're not going to get out of here. That little troll. It's so real. Every time you're going to press through. Every time you're going to go to the next level. And he wants to convince you that you are not who God says that you are. Luke 4. Look at this. Luke 4 verse 17. And I'm going through these scriptures just to kind of give you an idea. Because Jesus himself dealt with this. Okay? After he left where he couldn't do miracles, Jesus could have easily gone somewhere and gotten sad and depressed and said, maybe I'm not really called. Maybe I'm not really going to be able to do what God has sent me here to do. Look, in my own town, I couldn't do any miracles. In my own town, they didn't respect me. What if, what if I go to the next city and the same thing happens? What if I go to the next place and I encounter the same resistance? What if I'm not really able to walk out this person and he could have given up on his whole destiny because of one, two, or three negative experiences? It's the same thing that happens with us. You're trying to press. You're trying to go through to the next thing that God has for you. And here comes the accident. Here comes the sickness. Here comes the relationship problems. Here come the money problems just to set you back. And this is the thing. If the enemy can set you back in your mind, he can set your whole life back. As a man thinketh in his heart. You know what I'm talking about. Luke 4, verse 17. And it said, And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And he said to them, the spirit of the Lord is, a, is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. What happened after that? Somebody tell me what happened after that. What does it say? All spoke well of him. Hmm? It says, All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. But did somebody get mad? Yeah. They began to question who he was and what else. See, when he stood in boldness to declare what God spoke about him, people got angry. In the scripture that we just read, it says that they were offended. Why are you offended? 
Why are you offended? Because he's walking in the purpose that God has for him. Why are you offended? Why are you offended? It says, and they were offended at him. They were offended. Do you understand that you just being who God has called you to be and you choosing to walk out the purpose that God has for you, that some people are just going to be offended? Right. They're going to be offended because you decided to take God at his word. They're going to be offended because you choose to believe that God can use you. They're going to be offended because you're stepping out on faith and they're somewhere being a chicken. They're going to be offended because they see God opening doors for you. They're going to be offended because they see a change in your life. They're going to be offended because they see you fighting the good fight of faith. Why are they offended? Because your obedience only casts light on their disobedience. So the easiest thing to do is hate instead of celebrate or participate. All right. You have to understand the root of things when people come against you. Because if you don't understand the root of it, you'll go with their flow. And you will miss on what God has for you. You will miss out on the blessing that God has for you. So they got angry. They got angry. They got angry. The devil doesn't have any new tricks. God speaks a word over your life. And he says, I have a purpose for you. I have a future for you. I have good hope and a future. I have plans for you. To bless you and not to hurt you. To prosper you. I will enlarge your territory. I will bless your children's children. You are the head and you are not the tail. I will abundantly bless you. You're blessed to be a blessing. You're the child of Abraham. You are a co-heir with Christ. If, if, I, if I gave you my son with him, I will give you all things. Is there anything that I will withhold from you? If I gave you my son, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. I sent my son. All hope is in uh, the Lord. Everything that you need is in Christ Jesus. All of these promises, all of this blessing, all of this next level power that God has for us, and the devil playing the same tricks. If I could just get her to doubt that this is really who God said she is, then if she believes in her heart that she can't, she won't. If he believes in his heart, that God is not using men in that way in this season and in this time. If he believes he can't, he won't. So he comes to test that word. He comes to bring the depression. He comes and it's all to disconnect you from God. Because this is the thing that happens. And I had this note a little bit earlier. So you stop praying. Your finances get hit. Your relationship gets hit. Your health gets hit. You're frustrated. You're depressed. So you stop praying. You don't come to church. And this is the thing. And maybe, just maybe, you might even go back to picking up some old habits just to make yourself feel better. Oh, I got some witnesses in the room. You ain't picked up a bottle of beer in three years. But you're frustrated. And you're angry. And you find yourself at the bottom of the barrel and you don't know where to go and what to do. And the enemy pushes you, pushes your soul, to go back to what you used to do and how you used to live to make you what? Feel. To make you feel better. To make you feel happy. To make you feel like everything's going to be okay. But what happens when the buzz is gone? You back down where you started. When you need to feel better, you gotta learn how to go into worship. When you need to feel better, you gotta learn how to listen to the word of God. Well, Joanne, you always telling us the same thing. You tell us to pray. You tell us to worship. You tell us to hear the word of God. You tell us to get. What more do you want me to tell you? Do you want me to go tell you to watch uh, the Three Stooges? Do you want me to go tell you to to to, to go play spades? I mean, even though you don't want none of this, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just in case. Just in case somebody want to go there. Because I will bust out that big joke in a minute. <laughs> but he pulls you in. He pulls you in. He pulls you in. He pulls you in. And you know you have to know how to shake that joker off of you. And be like, mm -hmm. People will be offended. People will be angry. The enemy will use things to try to stop you from coming to church, from being in the house of God, from prayer, from worship. 
And then you find yourself, you know you ain't talked to that girl in like three months. You know she was trouble the last time you dumped her. But because you need to feel good. You're going back to something that's familiar. To deal with your emotions. I got some witnesses in the room. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate when you help me preach. I appreciate the honesty. Because we have nothing to prove to nobody. We ain't got to hide from nobody. But God has victory for us. He has victory for us. This is the other way that the enemy comes. So first he tries to convince you that what God said is not going to happen. That you're not who God says you are. He wants you to be depressed. He wants you to be sad. He wants you to disconnect you. He wants to disconnect you from the presence of God. He wants to make you impatient. Yeah. Impatient. Go with me to Mark. No, 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 sorry. Go with me to uh, Luke. Luke chapter 4. Go with me to Luke chapter 4. And I'm almost done. Even though I know you guys appreciate when I take my time, right? Yeah. Amen. Luke 4. We eat here before service so you don't have to be hungry and look at your watch. <laughs> you didn't know there was a reason for that, huh? Just in case the Holy Ghost moved and we got to be here an extra minute. Look at this. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. Somebody said he ain't got no new tricks. No new tricks. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So Jesus had fasted for 40 days. He was hungry. What is hungry? Hunger is an issue of the flesh, of the body. Okay? And the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. So he's testing his identity. He's testing, well, if you say you're the son of God, deal with your hunger in your own power. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him and all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you. Okay, here's the pride. He's testing his pride. And their glory, for this has been delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. See, the devil was just twisting all the scriptures. To try to get uh, Jesus to do what he wanted him to do. And Jesus answered him and said to him, It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Okay? What stood out to me when I read this and I studied this was the fact that Satan came to challenge who God said Jesus is. Okay? In the same way that Jesus' identity was challenged by the lack of miracles in the city, here he's having a face-to-face -face encounter where Satan is saying to him, if you're really the son of God, then do this. I have the power. If you worship me, I will give you this. If you, if you, if you, if you bow down before me, I will give you the land. I will give you the city. I will. He, he appealed to his pride. He appealed to his greed. He appealed to his need to be worshipped. He appealed to his need for power. Because that's all the areas where we're tempted as people. But what was the major temptation? What was Satan saying to him? Don't go through God's process. I will give you all of this ahead of time. And you don't have to go to the cross. Satan was saying, if you do it my way, I'll give you power. If you do it my way, I'll give you the cities. I will give you the world. If you do it my way, show me, prove to me that you're the son of God. Prove to me that you have power and do it in your own strength. Right. That's the same temptation that he gives the boy on the block. And the enemy whispers in his ear, say, go to school. For what? It'll take you too long. 
And by the end of it, you may only be making a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year when you can go ahead and just trap out here in the streets and make millions. Don't go through the process. Don't do it the right way. Don't do it God's way. Do it my way. And let me tell you, anywhere that the devil offers you a shortcut, you better run. You better run. Because what he wants to do is he wants you, he wants you to be so frustrated about the fact that there was no miracles and that people were challenging your calling and people were offended at you. That he's saying, you know what? So you don't have to go through the rejection. So you don't have to go through the process. So you don't have to go through the pain. Just come on over here with me and I'll give you the money quick. I'll give you the, the position quick. I'll give you what you want quick. Everybody will know your name. Everybody will applaud you. Everybody will celebrate you. And you won't have to go to the cross to get it. Right. And what we don't realize is that when we step in to do things the way the enemy wants us to do it, it's only a setup. Because anything that he gives you, he comes back to charge you for it with interest. Wow. Wow. He's the worst loan shark in existence. He gonna give you this, but when he comes back, he gonna want you to pay plus more. Let's move on. Philippians 2. I'm trying to paint a picture for you. Philippians 2. Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. So Jesus made a choice to go through the process. You don't think that there are times where I feel, I feel so much pressure that I just want to run. I want to get in my car and I want to cross somebody's state line and I want to just never come back because the pressure, the pressure. It's so hard. God, it's so hard. God, why does it have to be so hard? And over here, this person's doing this. And over here, this person. And ain't nobody suffering but me. And ain't nobody going through but me. God, why is it? Should it be this hard? And the enemy's like, just give it up. Just walk away. Why do you have to put up with this foolishness? Why do you have to do it the hard way? And you can go do this and make money. You can go do that and everything will be fine. See, he, he wants to appeal. He wants to appeal to your emotions. He wants to appeal to the lack. He wants you to appeal. Oh, you don't have to go through the process. Take the easy way out. Right. Say it. And forfeit my destiny. And give up on my purpose. See, because if you give up this time, you'll give up next time. If you run now, you'll be running forever. So why not make up your mind now that you're going to fight and stand and be who God has called you to be regardless of who's offended with you. Yeah. And decide that you're not going to take the shortcuts. Yeah. That you're going to pay the price. That you're going to go through the process. Yes. My God. That's what our Jesus did. Yes. And he was the son of God. Yes. We should follow his example, right? Yes. And being found as in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient to the point of death. Even the death of the cross. Therefore... So this is what the enemy tried to act like he could give him. But when God gives you something and the enemy gives you something, it's two totally different situations. Yes. And God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Yes. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. Mm. And that every time tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and Satan was saying, hey, if you worship me, I'll give you power. See, but if Jesus had taken the shortcut, he would have sold his soul to the devil and he may have what would have appeared as power. It's like people right now on the earth. They got all this fame. They got all this money. They have all this power. But in all of it, they think they are boss. In all of it, they think that they got it going on. In all of it, they think they're all that because the world worships them. Not realizing and understanding that when the end of their days come, they're just going to find themselves in bondage, in hell. Why? Because they took the shortcut. Because they accepted the devil's bargain. They took his deal. And so right now, they're the king of the world. But at the end of it all, 
They're going to find themselves face to face with the devil. Amen. Laughing in their face, saying, <laughs> you thought you were the boss. And I gave you all this money and all this fame. And you worshipped me with your body. And you worshipped me with your songs. And you worshipped me with your lifestyle. And now, you're in a jail that you can't get out of ever. But Jesus was willing to be ridiculed. He was willing to go to the cross. He was willing to sacrifice himself. He was willing to die for us. He obeyed to the point of death. And because of that, he was given a name that is above every name. And so now, because he went through the process, now even the devil is subject to Jesus. Does that make sense? Which means you, when you go through the process, and you don't take the shortcuts, and you do things God's way, that allows you in this life to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil and say, you have no authority. You have no power in my life. I see you trying to mess with my family. I see you trying to mess with my health. I see you trying to mess with my money. But in the name of Jesus, get out. See, you don't want God. You don't want to find yourself like those that try to cast out the demons. And the demons say, but Jesus, I know. Paul, I know, my uh -huh. But you, yeah. who you be? Yeah. Ain't got their tails whooped. Yeah. Yeah. No, you want. And when you stand in the face of the devil, he starts to get nervous and say, Whoa, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But Corey, I know you too. Oh, God, I'm out of here. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Why? Because I paid the price. Because I've gone through a process. Because I submitted myself under the mighty hand of God. Because I was willing to go through whatever it is that I had to go through. I was willing to suffer every once in a while. I was willing to take up my cross and follow Jesus. I was willing to press on when I didn't want to press on. I was willing to worship when I didn't feel like worshiping. I was willing to come to church and get the word when I was too tired from working all day. I was willing to step out of law for five days and roll myself out of bed. And even if you snow five minutes after you start you try. And you get pressed and you get crushed. But that's where the anointing comes from. That's where the power comes from. That's where the authority comes from. So you don't want to be a follower of Jesus Christ with no authority. You want to be a follower of Jesus Christ and have authority and power to stand toe to toe with the devil and say, Now, devil, I see you working in my family. I see you working in my money. I see you working in my house. And in the name of Jesus, get your hands off my kids. Get your hands off my marriage. Get your hands off my husband. Get your hands off everything that belongs to me. Hey, Jesus! 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 Jesus!
your spirit. That power and that authority. That strength to stop taking the shortcut. That press that you need. I declare it over your life right now. The press. The press. Woo! Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Ten. Verse three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds. See, what we don't realize is that the devil has no new tricks. And he keeps tripping us up with the same thing. Over and over and over again. But you have to settle in your heart and your mind once and for all who God says you are. And fight. Fight to remain in position. Fight to remain prayerful. Fight to remain in worship and connected to the Spirit of God. You have to fight for it. And where does that fight begin? In your mind. Where is that fight? It's in your mind and in your heart. Right. You're not going to walk out of here and roll up your sleeves and go punch somebody. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you stand in the position of the authority of God. And you realize I am not fighting people. I am not fighting flesh. I am not fighting blood. But I am fighting against spiritual principalities that have been assigned to destroy me since I came out of my mother's womb. So when that man touched you at a young age, that was nothing but the devil trying to work through him to destroy you so you wouldn't get to your purpose. So when that car accident happened, that was nobody but the devil trying to kill you so you wouldn't be able to get to your destiny. When you got caught up in that adulterous affair and you don't even know how you got there, that was nothing but the devil trying to work behind the scenes to destroy you so that you would feel so guilty that you'd never be able to step into who God said that you are. But you know what? You have to be able to stand in the forgiveness of God, stand in the love of God, and say, that is not who I am. That may be what I did, but that is not who I am. That may be what I did, but it is not who I am. It's not who God says you are. It's not who you were created to be. So you have to settle in your heart and in your mind and understand that you're not wrestling with flesh. You're not wrestling with blood. So for you to stay in the bed and pull the covers over your head, all you're going to do is give the devil more time to work against you. Wow. That's it. Because when you finally get up out of the bed, because you got to get up, yeah. at least to go to the bathroom, you're going to have to get up. All you've got is wasted time. Yeah. And now you feel worse. Because you've given the devil more time to work in the spirit against you. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds, for the pulling down of sickness, for the pulling down of confusion, for the pulling down of bitterness and anger and frustration and everything else the devil tries to use to separate you from who God called you to be. See, the war is not with your spouse. The war is not with your children. The war is not with your boss. The war is not with your co-worker. The war is with the devil himself and every demonic spirit that works for him and with him. A sign to destroy you. That's the bottom line. And he doesn't take days off. This is why you can't take days off from being in the presence of God. Sunday is not enough. And 90% of you don't come on Tuesdays. You could at least be getting two services a week that's going to give you the spiritual nutrition that you need. But I get you maybe once every other week. I mean, I'm just saying. But I have to bring that to your attention. Why? Because if you're not eating and you don't allow me to feed you and you don't allow me to give you this word and the spirit of God, then you're out there hungry in the spirit and tired in the spirit and exhausted in the spirit and you will try to live your life fighting off these demons in the flesh. And God is saying you can't do that because you're not wrestling with flesh and blood. 
but you're wrestling and fighting against principalities. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds. Listen to this verse 5. Casting down arguments. Where's the argument happening in your mind? You ain't never going to get out of this one. God doesn't have a purpose for you. And you really messed up this time. Who do you think you are? You're not going nowhere. You're not going to get there. You're just fooling yourself. You're such a hypocrite. You act one way in front of Pastor Corey, and then you act another way when he's not around. You know what? You better work on pleasing God and stop worrying about pleasing people. Because it's not about that. The Word of God, casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, cast down arguments, cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So there are thoughts and there are demonic spirits and they whisper in your ear and they talk to you about what you're not going to do and who you're not going to be and you're not going to get there and you're not enough and God doesn't love you and you're such a hypocrite and you're not, never going to get there. So you say, why should I even pray if God's not going to hear my prayer because I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not holy enough. And guess what? That's not how it works. God says, come to me. All ye who are what? Heavy laden and I will give you what? Rest. I will give you rest. Casting down arguments at every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Here is the ticket. Bringing every thought into the captivity. Into captivity. To the obedience of Christ. So what does that mean? When the thought comes to your mind, you have to get in the word of God and figure out what is it that God says that is the opposite of what the enemy is saying so that you can take that negative thought and dismantle it so it doesn't have authority over you. Right. And you got to say it out loud. Out loud. God doesn't forgive you. You can't pray because God saw what you did last night. No, devil, you're a liar. Because the word of God said that if I confess my sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive me. And God said that I could come boldly before his throne and find grace for the time of need. So, devil, you are a liar because God has promised me that I can come before God through the blood of Jesus. You're taking that thought and you are dismantling it and you're replacing God's thought into your mind. So now you're taking that thought captive. It's like going into court and saying, I plead my case. And they're saying, no, they're guilty. And you're able to dismantle and say, no, I'm not guilty. Because the fingerprint that is on that gun is not my fingerprint. So how can you tell me it was me when that's not even my fingerprint? And I wasn't even there. I was across town. It's not about sitting there and letting them put you in jail. It's about dismantling and getting the proof that you need to bring down that argument. And the proof is where? In God's word. In what God has said about you. In what God has spoken about you. In what God has declared about you. The devil has no new trick, but you can learn how to overcome him. You can learn to overcome him. Oh my God, it's almost one o'clock, Jesus. And being ready. So casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive into the obedience of Christ and listen to this, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So when you obey, when you take that thought captive, when you grab a hold of your victory, you're punishing the devil himself because he wasn't able to beat you. That's victory. That's victory. Close your Bibles. The devil has no tricks. But if you learn, close your eyes and bow your hands. If you learn to fight, if you learn not to take the shortcuts, if you learn to press, if you learn to take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, you will rise above everything that the enemy has set against you to destroy you. And you will go to the next level of glory Amen. in what God has for you. <laughs> Father, I thank you. Thank you You're not raising us up to be soulish. You're not raising us up, God, to be emotional Christians. God, but you are raising us up as warriors of the kingdom of God. You are raising us up as sons and daughters of the Most High God to understand who we are and who you have made us to be. Give us the strength that we need, the courage that we need, and teach us, Father God, to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ 
Teach us, Father God, how to get in the word of God and address that a voice that speaks to our mind and is saying the opposite of what God has said. Yes, because that's where the victory is. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I don't know if you're here this morning and you have not given your heart to Jesus Christ and you are not saved at this time. While everybody's head is bowed and eyes closed, two seconds, I need you to lift your hand. The word of God says that today is the day of salvation. If I'm talking to you, if you're not walking with God, if you are in a backslidden state, if you're not sure if you died right now, you would go to heaven and you would go to be with God. I need you to not be ashamed of your need for Jesus Christ and lift your hand quickly. Yes, thank you. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Just begin to pray. Begin to pray. Open your mouth and begin to pray for those that are in this room that are making that decision now. Father God, I thank you. Father, I thank you. God, I thank you. Miss Kim, would you go back there and pray with her and lead her in the prayer of salvation? Is there anyone else? Father, I thank you for every person that is in this room. I thank you, God, that our hearts and our souls are secure. I thank you, Father God, that we are saved. I thank you right now for your goodness and your mercy, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Miss Kim, if you can go with her into the lobby. Hallelujah. Were you blessed by the word of God? I would apologize for keeping you a little longer than usual, but I'm not going to do that because I believe it's what you needed for today. Amen. We have a few things that we need to do before we go.